Good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Let's get straight to the very latest out of Ukraine this morning, where the long-standing safe haven of Lviv in the country's western region is now under attack. Overnight, the city's mayor says that Russian missiles bombarded an area close to Lviv's airport, upending the sense of peace that many Ukrainians sought when they fled violence in the east. Across the country, Russia's violent offensive is intensifying, striking key cities from Kyiv to Mariupol to Odessa on the Black Sea. The attacks are reducing many residential areas to rubble, throttling crucial resources like food, water and heat for thousands. Back here at home, President Biden is ratcheting up the rhetoric when it comes to his Russian counterpart. The murderous dictator, a pure thug who is waging an immoral war against the people of Ukraine. Happening this morning, another high-stakes conversation in the name of diplomacy. President Biden will hold a phone call with China's President Xi amid Washington's mounting concerns of the People's Republic's expanded ties with Moscow. All the while, Eastern Europe's refugee crisis worsens. More than 3.2 million displaced by the war. According to the latest UN count, civilians from across the region now stepping up to help those who need it most. Why are you doing this? Well, if you go to the train station at night and see people with little children freezing there, it's cold at night, I mean, you have no choice. NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel begins our coverage this hour from the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv, which was hit by another missile this morning. A warning, some viewers may find the following images distressing. Russia's continuing its relentless bombing campaign overnight, hitting an aircraft repair facility near the airport in Lviv and here in the capital, Kyiv, hitting what seems to be Russia's favorite target these days, another residential compound full of civilians. At least one person was killed here, more than a dozen injured. But when you look at the scale of the damage, it could have been far worse. In other circumstances, it would be called terrorism, attacking civilians in Kyiv this morning in their homes as they were waking for breakfast on purpose. But since a state did this, it's called yet another attack on a soft target. For Ukrainians, the result is the same. The attack happened around 8 o'clock in the morning, and it didn't just destroy one apartment building, but landed right in the center of a complex, destroying a playground, and all the homes around it. In one apartment, a sink is covered in blood. More stains by the door, likely from the injured, making their way out. An elementary school in the compound was also damaged. So was a kindergarten and a supermarket. Salvaging what she could, Allah was still coming to terms with how her life was upended in an instant. I have no home now and nowhere to live. Where am I to go, she asked. With Russia's military offensive stalled and its troops suffering thousands of casualties to dogged Ukrainian resistance, Russia is lashing out at civilians in a punishing campaign of collective punishment. North of Kyiv, in hard-hit Chernihiv, the State Department confirmed an American was killed yesterday. He was identified by family and friends as Jimmy Hill from Minnesota. A teacher, he was in Ukraine to be with his partner Irina, who has multiple sclerosis. He was searching for food when he died in a bread line, killed along with at least nine other people in Chernihiv. His sister spoke to NBC's affiliate in Minneapolis. My brother would spend like half of the year here and then the other half uh, arranged in uh, Ukraine and then getting teaching positions at different universities to do lectures and things like that so he could be with Ira in this last trip. He was getting special medicine organizing that. He really loved her so deeply. And it's, you know, um, in this world, it's hard to find like your soulmate. And that's how he referred to Ira as his soulmate. Every day, more lives are being lost here, even as peace negotiations are picking up steam with Turkey emerging as a key mediator. But based on the scale of the attacks, the frequency of the attacks, and the fact that it is constantly civilians who are being targeted, doesn't seem like a ceasefire is going to come together anytime soon.
Richard, thank you so much. For more on the situation in Ukraine, let's bring in Hagar Shamali. She is the host of Oh My World on YouTube and the former spokesperson for the U.S. mission to the U.N. Thanks for joining us this morning. I mean, let's start out with the latest in the fighting inside Ukraine, the state of peace talks between Ukraine and Russia. We just heard Richard sort of give his assessment there. Do you think the Ukrainians are gaining more strength at the negotiating table each day they're able to hold on to their key cities? Do you think we could see a breakthrough in peace talks if that keeps up? Well, typically when you're fighting a dictator like Putin, and it's the same, I learned these lessons when I handled Syria, time is not usually on the side of the defender. It's usually mm. on the side of the aggressor because they have no regard for civilian life when it comes to Putin and the Russian military. They don't care if they fight until the last man standing. And you see that. And Richard Engel, I thought, summed it up so well when he said that under any other circumstances, this would be called terrorism. I'm going to go out and call it terrorism because the definition of terrorism is targeting innocent civilians to achieve a political or ideological goal. And that is exactly what Putin is doing. Unfortunately, my experience in Syria only taught me that dictators don't stop. They, they fight until they can try to walk away with a win. They will. Things will get much worse. And the dictator is never at risk of, of falling. The thing that gives me hope here, because I don't want to bring everybody down, but the thing that gives me hope here are two things at the same time that are happening that we have to bolster, we, the Europeans, and NATO have to bolster at the, at the same time, which are, on one hand, how strong and united the Ukrainian resistance is. And obviously, the latest package of military aid is very strong, anti-aircraft systems, uh, switchblade drones. Switchblade drones are things that crash into their target and explode. These are really strong items that's really great. I personally don't see why we, we don't give the Ukrainian military the MiG fighter jets that they want. Mm. But all of it is building up because that military threat is the most important while those negotiations happen at the same time. And so if any, I do, I think it's great that those negotiations are happening. I would never trust Russia for to hold a ceasefire, as Richard mentioned. Um, but I do think we need to help President Zelensky in yeah. thinking through the options to give Putin something to step back. Let's talk about a new important layer here, which is China's potential involvement or, or what we could see happen from the Chinese president. So President Biden is expected to talk with China's President Xi this morning. Now, we know Russia had asked them for this assistance. I think we're all expecting that Biden is going to denounce that. But is there a chance here that we could see the opposite. Rather than assistance from Russia, this relationship between Putin and Xi mean that, that there's the potential there for pressure to end this from the Chinese end? I think that the most realistic thing we can hope for from China is that they don't help Russia, but not necessarily that they get involved mm. to pull Putin back. And the reason is because Xi himself has his own eyes on Taiwan. Right. And he's watching very closely to see how the world is reacting to Russia invading its neighbor, to see how the world might react if he were to invade his neighbor. And so he's and but but President Xi, the difference between President Xi and President Putin is that he plays the long game and he always has. And so while the world is communicating to President Xi, you are either with all of us, with Ukraine or with Russia, President Xi is trying to look for a third path and trying to see, OK, maybe I could not come out so publicly, but I'm also not going to throw my friend Putin under the bus. And he's trying to pursue that. And Biden today in his call is going to say something along the lines of, you know, you can't go do that. There are, like I said, the best we can hope for is that he doesn't proactively help Putin. He already is pretty much by allowing Russian propaganda to move through China and, and so on. He cannot give military equipment and, and, and support and aid. And I think that the thing that President Biden should hit, and I believe he will, is the threat of economic sanctions. And I think you're going to see if Congress passes a bill allowing secondary sanctions, which mm. are sanctions that allow the U.S. to sanction those doing business with a sanctioned target. Wow. Sorry, that's a lot of words used <laughs> with sanction in them. Um, but that allows the U.S. to increase the pressure more and the threat. And China cares about that threat because their economic power is what gives them this influence that they mm -hmm. exert around the world. And, Agar, very quickly, I want to kind of follow up on that. When we talk about sanctions toward Russia, do you think there is more the U.S. and our allies could be doing to punish Russia, keep the pressure on them to try and stop this? 
These sanctions are, are really unprecedented. I mean, the, in all, and I worked at Treasury and sanctions for many years, and they are the toughest I've ever seen, and not because of the specific options they pursued, but because Russia is such an active player in, the, in, in international trade and so such an active participant in the international financial system that you ha there's a real opportunity there to freeze assets and block billions and trillions of dollars of trade, and that's what they're doing. There's always more, always. When it comes to sanctions, there's always more you can do. There are more sectors in Russia you you could target. You could target the timber sector, the aluminum and steel sector. Mm -hmm. You could target more Russian political officials. But I, I want to stress that what we've done already, the, the, preventing them from accessing their foreign reserves abroad, sanctioning Putin and the oligarchs, um, going after the oil and gas sector, these are the biggest things. And now it's it's mostly about enforcement, mm -hmm. finding those hidden assets and exposing them, helping Europe decrease its consumption yeah. of Russian oil and gas, stuff like that. Hagar, thank you so much. We so appreciate your perspective and walking us through all that. Good to see you. The United Nations says the refugee crisis in Ukraine and Eastern Europe is growing exponentially. More than three million people have left the country since Russia's invasion, and the flow of refugees is not slowing down. Here's NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez with more. From train stations to border crossings to churches, the largest refugee crisis since World War II is growing larger by the hour. <laughs> this woman escaped with her two dogs and little else as her home near Kiev was bombed. Do you know where you'll go with her? Mama this mother tells me she's heading to Poland, like most of these refugees. But the UN says the numbers are rising exponentially throughout Europe, in Romania, Moldova, Hungary, Slovakia, and others. In all, a staggering 3.2 million people have already fled Ukraine in just weeks. <laughs> Reverend Igor Ivanishov calls it surreal and he's stepping in to help. Why are you doing this? Well, if, if you go to the train station at night and see people with little children freezing there, it's cold at night, I mean, you have no choice. At his church, now a shelter, we meet Bogdan, who tells us he's lost touch with his wife and four children after the home where they were staying without him was bombed. He hasn't heard from them in nearly a week. You don't know where your family is? Yeah, I know that they're... Um, not in Ukraine, go, but don't know where. We're also seeing the first survivors from the siege in Mariupol make the treacherous journey out of the ravaged city and into western Ukraine. At a children's hospital, we meet Oksana and her eight-year-old son. Not only is his country at war, he's fighting cancer. He's scared. He's exhausted, Oksana tells us. We lived in a basement for three weeks. But there are glimmers of hope. After we first spoke, Bogdan finally got a hold of his wife and kids. They're somewhere in Poland, heading to Germany. I think uh, God is listening to me and uh, answered. I'm really, really happy. <laughs> At least one prayer answered there. But for so many of these families, they don't know where they're going to head to next or if they'll even have a home to return to. These are long days and even longer nights. Joan Savannah. Just heartbreaking. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you so much. Now, staying with the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber visited several border crossings with neighboring Poland. There, she met with some of the refugees fleeing the conflict. Along the Polish-Ukrainian border, there are eight official crossings, lifelines for the sea of refugees fleeing the devastation of war. Our team has been to every one. This is the northernmost border crossing on the Polish-Ukrainian border. They only allow vehicle traffic to come through here, but we've seen buses carrying families like this one, young children coming across the border. At Dorohusk, we met 15-year-old Yuri, whose father sent him to Poland with his mother and young siblings. What did he say to you to do with your family? Uh, she told me that I'm, I'm was that they must protect them. At Zoshin, instead of separation, a reunion at the gates between a father working in Poland and his wife and little girl. In Dohobichov, it was quiet on our side, but on the Ukrainian side, a 20-hour wait to cross. In Rebine, time was on the mind of 83-year-old Ladmila as a harsh reality set in. She may never return to her beloved Ukraine. 
in my heart it's painful. I'm, I'm missing Ukraine already. I want, I just want to cry. At border crossing number five, Budomesh, children played in sand spread out for a makeshift refugee camp. They used suitcases as tables to draw and somehow managed to smile. Do you want to go back home? Do you want to go back home? Of course, of course I want to. Because my sisters and brothers are there. And, and the, the daddy. In Korchova, we watched bus after bus arrive, babies crying, travelers weary. These are children they need to sleep, they need to be washed, they need, they need to, to do everything that they normally do, but instead they're sleeping in corridors. At Medica, the busiest crossing, some comfort, volunteers offered hot food. Nice and warm. At Kroshinko, we met Danya and his soon-to-be-named monkey. Over 1.8 million refugees have fled to Poland in three weeks, most of them women and children, the youngest Ukrainians and the oldest. This is 68 years of my life in this bed. One, two, three. Each now carrying the weight of what's left behind to a future unknown. Oh, our thanks to Ellis and Barber for that report. Of course, tough to watch. Now, we'll have continuing coverage of the war in Ukraine right after the break. But first, we want to get to some of the other major headlines. Stateside, just ahead, ghost guns, the build-it-yourself weapons kit that's impossible to track and requires no background check to get a hold of it. We'll take a cl closer look at this dangerous trend that's taking America's streets by storm. Plus, while COVID restrictions are rolling back across the country, things still might look a little different when hitting the road for that long put off dream vacation. We'll tell you about the pandemic protocols that are sticking around after the break. Welcome back. More of our coverage of the war in Ukraine coming up, including the impact of the invasion on the country's young professionals. But we do want to get to some of the other stories making news this morning. Let's start with an exclusive look inside America's surging ghost gun market. These are largely untraceable firearms built from simple kits that can be bought online or at gun shows. No background checks required. NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard takes us into one of those gun shows and shows us just how easy it is for people to make these weapons. This is a ghost gun. There's no record of it. It took no background check. And we have no idea how many like it are on our streets today. Because it's built from a perfectly legal pre-packaged kit and then made into a working firearm in the amount of time it takes to build an Ikea cabinet, just over an hour. There was a black market ghost gun sale that went bad and turned deadly. A 16-year-old student gunned down two classmates. Law enforcement tell NBC News the weapon may have been a ghost gun. The firearm in evidence is described as an 80 percenter. A ghost gun. Last year, the LAPD recovering more than double the number of ghost guns compared to the year before in the weapons used in at least 24 homicides in the city. In Philadelphia, the police department recovered 571 constructed ghost guns, more than five times the number in 2019. But just how easy is it to order the parts for these guns? This is our NBC producer, Jason, who lives here in Pennsylvania. There are a litany of options that come up of where you could purchase these kits. Boom. But with the tools, you wanna make sure you have everything. It tells you the exact parts you literally need to buy. This is where I suggest you get ammo from. Done. Thank you for your purchase. Jason was able to place this order because he lives in one of the 40 states that has not regulated the selling of these kits. And that's also why we were able to walk into this gun show outside of Philadelphia. We went in with a hidden camera to show just how easy it is to buy a kit. Or you can just leave with it today. I mean, and you don't need anything from me, right? Money. Money? Yeah. But no ID or anything. We're not doing background check. No. So then I'll just need uh, essentially the drill. It comes just with the drill bits. Comes with the drill bits and yeah. everything. And then, like I said, you're just drilling three holes on each side. Cut these tabs off. There's tons and tons of videos online. Okay. Like if you use Google. How long does it usually take you? First time, it's probably going to be like an hour and a half. Okay. Hours. Okay. I mean, my fastest time was like 24 minutes. 24 minutes? Yeah. To buy other firearms at this show, 
they required background checks. But to get this kit, it just took that cash. Have you seen the demand for your supply going up? Yeah, the, the entire industry has gone up. We tracked down Jordan Van Rowe, the major ghost gun kit supplier in Pennsylvania, as we left the show. So don't you bear some responsibility then when these guns get into the hands of criminals? No, because I'm not a criminal. But you're essentially handing them a piece that they can build in a half an hour and turn it into a gun. Uh, yeah, you can get keys and a pack of Budweiser and drunk drive kill somebody too. Last year, the man who ran Pennsylvania's major gun shows agreed to no longer allow the sale of these kits. But when met with pushback by Van Rowe and others, he sold the gun shows to Van Rowe, who went right back to selling them. You're following the laws right now. Yeah, 100%. Handing over those kits just for cash, that is by the books. Yeah, it's like buying a lawn chair at Walmart. You can buy a lawn chair in cash. Plus, these kits and the guns they turn into are harder to track because most don't have serial numbers. Because of these legal loopholes, many of them across the country, from shows and online sales, are bought by former convicts who are, by law, barred from owning these weapons. As just one example, there were 586 such convicts arrested with ghost guns in Los Angeles just last year. This is the beginning of a ghost gun. This reality has led many to call for a change in the law. Pennsylvania Attorney General Josh Shapiro has tried to classify these ghost gun kits as firearms. That would force people to pass a background check to get them. Do you even begin to know how many are out on the streets? I think it's almost impossible to know at this point. We need a national answer. But there is no sign of legislation passing on Capitol Hill. The Biden administration is, however, working on formalizing new regulations to help curb the rise. A ghost gun should be treated like a regular firearm. Two weeks later, we returned to Pennsylvania and met up with special agents from the AG's office who agreed to use the kit we purchased from the show and build it into a ghost gun. But we also could have done it ourselves. If you just go to YouTube, videos, how to, are still all over the internet. We won't show you all the steps, but for the agents, it just took some drilling, sanding down, and a little bit of hammering. A firearm. Just over one hour later, ready to go. Wow, pretty stunning look there. Our thanks to Von Hilliard for that report. Now, here in New York State, thieves stole thousands of dollars in handbags from a Balenciaga store in the Hamptons on Thursday. It's the latest in a rash of smash-and-grab robberies on high-end retailers across the country. NBC News Now correspondent Zinclay Esamwa has the details. A Hamptons handbag heist. Around $94,000 worth of luxury goods stolen from a New York Balenciaga store. Now police say they've arrested four people with one suspect at large and worry of copycat crimes. This is a part of an organized retail theft ring uh, that is responsible for crimes. On display at the press conference, a pile of recovered handbags, all stolen by a, quote, organized retail theft ring in just 24 seconds on March 3rd. When she went into the store, she asked uh, about a pair of shoes. And when the, uh, the clerk went to get those shoes, uh, the four co-conspirators rushed in. Police say they were led on a high-speed chase, topping 100 miles per hour, eventually leading to a foot pursuit and arrests. Authorities announced that the group was indicted and faces felony charges. Meth was also found in the getaway vehicle, leading to drug charges. In 2021, a wave of smash and grab robberies hit the West Coast, leaving shoppers on edge. So it is kind of scary. And the fact that this has happened now makes me wonder if I should even walk in there. Organized shoplifting crews smashing windows and fleeing in getaway cars. I probably saw 50 to 80 people in like ski masks, crowbars, night, like a bunch of weapons. Back on the East Coast, according to the National Retail Federation, New York is one of the leading cities affected by organized retail crimes. In January, a Louis Vuitton was hit on Long Island, a masked group alleged to have stolen 20 luxury handbags. It's terrible, and I hope they catch the people and that they uh, arrest them. In D.C., athleisure store Lululemon was robbed twice. Four suspects in hoodies and face masks walked out, arms full of apparel. Then three suspects, also in hoodies, entered and, according to police, stole $15,000 worth of merchandise. The case is open and under investigation as cities around the country work to end these store steals. All right, our thanks to Zinclay SMO for bringing us that report. Now to the rise of an Omicron subvariant. It's known as BA2, and it's fueling the current spike in COVID cases in Europe and China. 
Health officials in the U.S. expect the number of cases linked to the variant will go up in the coming weeks. Right now, cases in the U.S. are down 40 percent over the last two weeks. Deaths are also down 60 percent in that same time period. But experts warn BA2 has the potential to start another surge. And if it does, they warn we may not be prepared. Well, now a new leader is taking over as White House COVID-19 response coordinator, Dr. Ashish Jha, the dean of Brown University's School of Public Health. He spoke to the Today Show about his new position and the spread of BA2. Let's listen to some of that. So BA2 is around. It's, it's in the U.S. as well. We've got a lot of it, not as much as Europe. Um, here's what we know about BA2. Uh, we know it's a little bit more transmissible than BA1. BA1 was that sub variant of Omicron that swept through America in January. So a little more transmissible. Our vaccines, especially if you're boosted, provide the same level of protection. Congrats on the new gig, White House COVID-19 response coordinator. Uh, what's going to be the first order of business? Yeah, you know, Craig, as much as we all wish, the pandemic is not over. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do to prepare for future surges, to prefer, prepare for future variants if we get them. Uh, so the, the first order of business is the president has laid out a really comprehensive plan for how we prepare. And it's about executing on that plan. It's about making sure we have enough tests and vaccines and therapeutics and masks. It's about vaccinating the world so that uh, we can get this pandemic finally behind us. We've got to execute on that plan. That's what I'm going to be focused on when I joined the administration. Now, in a statement released by Brown University, Dr. Jha said, quote, to the American people, I promise I will be straightforward and clear in sharing what we know and explaining what we don't know and how we will learn more and what the future will ask of all of us. Now, with COVID cases dropping and spring break underway, many Americans are ready to book their next flight to paradise. But much has changed about the travel industry in the last two years. Many hotels are opting to keep some of the health protocols put into place when the pandemic began, including things like contactless check-in and thorough cleaning services. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch joins us now from Universal City, California, with more on what to expect when you're checking into a hotel as you take off on a vacation. Hey, Jesse, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. You can see right now pretty quiet here. It's still early out west, right? But we can expect that in just a couple of hours, this place will be buzzing with visitors from out of town. Some people taking their first big trip in about two years. And if you haven't taken a vacation since before COVID, some of what you see when you check in might look a little bit different than you remember. From the skies to the seas, travelers are once again flocking to their dream destinations. Being able to get out there and actually enjoy, you know, traveling, it's great to be back. And while many may be itching for that long-awaited vacation, these days hitting the road for some R&R looks a little different. COVID restrictions are rolling back, but some travel changes are sticking around, at least for now. Many hotels cut back on housekeeping services, limiting or getting rid of daily cleanings and turndown services altogether, with some now offering on-demand housekeeping by request. But at higher-end properties and luxury boutique hotels, daily room cleaning services are back. The Points Guy says complimentary breakfast spreads, some restaurants and lounges, gyms, kids' clubs, room service, and even concierges are also absent from many hotels because of COVID. Some tourists with jam-packed sightseeing schedules unfazed by the hotel changes they've seen. The hotel is pretty much to sleep, shower, change, and go back at it again. So it's not really much of a big deal for us. Some hotels also moving to a more contactless experience, turning smartphones into room keys. Others are even offering check-in and check-out on an app. Aboard cruise ships, guests decide how often and when their cabins are cleaned. And mobile apps are now a go-to for everything from menus to dinner and show reservations. While most of these protocols were put in place for safety, some believe they're sticking around thanks to labor shortages. The cost of hiring these people became exorbitant. And the reality was that they could still use COVID as an excuse to not provide these services. If you're taking public transportation or flying, TSA says you still need to put on a mask until April 18th. That mask mandate also applies in airports before and after you fly. Another reminder on your next big trip, that dream destination might look a little bit different. But if you're hoping for something as close as possible to a trip from years past, call ahead and find out which services and amenities are and are not available. Savannah, back to you. That is some good advice. Jesse Kirsch, thank you so much.
Looks like Dolly Parton could, could still end up in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Earlier this week, we told you the country superstar asked to be left off the list of nominees for the Hall. Now the foundation is breaking its radio silence on Parton's position, suggesting it might be too late for the music legend to back out. It seems a name as big as Dolly Parton could never be out of place, but that's exactly how the Queen of Country says she felt after being nominated to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I just feel like that's more for the people in rock music. I still didn't feel right about it. It kind of would be like putting ACDC in the Country Music Hall of Fame. Parton shocked fans earlier this week when she said she would respectfully bow out of consideration for the honor. While well, the Hall of Fame remained muted for days, this morning the foundation is indicating it won't be changing its tune and will leave the decision to voters, calling Parton's note thoughtful, but adding her music influenced countless artists. We are in awe of Dolly's brilliant talent and are proud to have nominated her. Woo! Another reason to keep Parton's name in play, the Hall of Fame sent out its 1,200 ballots days before Dolly said she wanted to drop out. My coat of many colors While being inducted as a core country artist is rare, Dolly would not be alone. Legends like Johnny Cash, Jimmy Rogers, and Chet Atkins all have their cowboy hats hanging in Rock's famed hall. performances have rocked global audiences and even Studio 1A. Take us in, Dolly. Savannah and Hoda right. channeled the country icon Jolene, as the trio Jolene, jammed out to Jolene. I think you girls are behind. You better stick to your <laughs> hosting. Above her many accolades, when Parton sat down with me in 2020, she spoke of what she prizes most, her charitable efforts, like her book gifting program, The Imagination Library. You, of course, have a legacy in music, but... This is part of your legacy too, isn't it? I have to honestly say that I probably am as proud of this as anything I will ever do. And I will Her grace, one of the many reasons we will always love Dolly. The Rock Hall also takes votes from fans into account. Despite Dolly announcing that she didn't want to be inducted this time, she's actually held on to fourth place in the Rock Hall's official fan vote. If she finishes in the top five, then she'll get more votes added to her total. So she might not be able to stop this train. Yeah. We're going to have to wait and see. We'll find out in May, I believe, when the who the inductees are. Yeah. So. I wonder if fans are like, no, we love you, Dolly. Or they're like, well, that's not what you want. Right. Or voters, too. Like, right. are the voters saying, OK, we're yeah, going to respect your yeah. wish. We're not going to vote for you. Or are they saying, no, no, no. We're going to yeah, vote for you. you deserve it. We're going to find out, but... Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, thanks uh, Chief Dolly Correspondent. <laughs> Let's go check on your morning news now. Weather? Bill Karens is back with us. Hey, Bill. More attention, more votes. That's my vote. I know, yeah. yeah uh, this is all right? a yeah. secret campaign, right, Bill? That's what she's doing here. <laughs> it is. It would be the <laughs> smartest PR move ever. Uh, yeah, really. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Only my diabolical mind would actually uh, twist that around to the other Yeah, no, don't put um, that on Dolly. So, <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, so the weekend forecast is shaping up to be a kind of a rough start to it and then actually a pretty decent finish on Sunday. We're still concerned with the threat of severe weather today, tonight, right into tomorrow morning. We have a new tornado watch that has just been issued for areas from Mobile, now including the Pensacola area. So just sliding right along that I-10 corridor with these storms as they continue to roll. Now here's how it's going to play out through the day today. So all that warm, humid air. I mean, the temperatures are in the 80s and it's humid. It almost feels like an early summer day along the Gulf Coast, and that's why we have the severe weather threat. These storms will then be pushing to the east. The strong winds behind it will help the storm development, and then by the time we get to about this afternoon, the storm should be through Georgia. By 8 p.m. this evening, the storm should go from Tallahassee all the way to Savannah, and then we'll get a little bit of a break overnight, and then a new line of storms early tomorrow afternoon right along the South Carolina, North Carolina coast, and we could even see some strong storms with wind gusts in central New York and also in Pennsylvania. So for today, we're very very warm uh, D.C., New York, once the fog burns off. West Coast, no problems. And then the weekend forecast gets a little interesting. Saturday on the West Coast, some rain and snow. Light rain in the Northeast. And there's your reward day, guys, on Sunday. Everywhere east of the Rockies should be mild and sunny. All right. We've, well, we've earned it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Been through a lot this winter. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill.
Coming up on Morning News Now, a consequence of war that rarely makes headlines. People's professional and social lives put on hold. Our own Jacob Soboroff has the stories of young professionals living in Ukraine, now forced to live a new life. That's after the break. Welcome back. The war in Ukraine has turned each of the 44 million lives in the Eastern European nation upside down. Millions have left the country or have been displaced internally. Now, what becomes of Ukraine's future generations hangs in the balance. NBC News correspondent Jacob Silberov had an intimate conversation with a young group of Ukrainians who have had to put their lives and futures on hold. Last night, as curfew approached, I went to a walk-up apartment in Lviv to meet seven friends who fled nearly 350 miles from Kyiv as the first rockets hit. Today, living in what feels like an alternate universe. The mirror in the hallway to an apartment some of them now share was the first clue. When the bomb uh, will be somewhere near us, it's uh, the tape which uh, protects the mirror from um, um, I'm shattering. Of, yes. I'm Jacob. Hi, Hi Jacob. Hi. Welcome. This is Ihor. The 27-year-old consultant was up late when Russia attacked. I was super scared. Mm -hmm. I was shaking, like, literally. I just, like, for the first five minutes, I was shocked. Three weeks ago, 27-year-olds Nastya and Max didn't believe a war was possible. Now they're here. So I was a lawyer. You're talking in the past tense. You said I was. Yeah, because I'm not anymore. I have no job today. Even pastimes are a thing of the past. 30-year-old Zhenya's passion was music. Before the war, I, I was a DJ, and since 21st, I can't listen to the music at all. But that's what you love. That was your job. <laughs> yeah, but also you have to it hear the, the, the alarm. <laughs> <laughs> the alarm meaning the air raid siren. Editor Tetiana, 27, and marketing manager Dimitro, 29, shared videos with us of their life in Kyiv before the war. Now his future could be taking up arms. If I have to fight, I will fight gladly. Um, it's not a thing that I would run from. Sometimes I feel like it's a dream, just the, the, the most horrible dream in my life. And tomorrow uh, I will wake up and everything will, be, will disappear. A group of friends not thinking about each other, <laughs> but their country. You didn't have to do this. I'm a some guy from L.A. that showed up into your life and here you all are talking to me with a bunch of cameras in the middle of a war. Why did you want to why did you want to speak out? We think that we need to use every instrument to do this and to share information um, all over the world. If I can say one word to like to everybody who will be watching us, don't forget about what's happening in Ukraine. Our thanks to Jacob Silbra for that mm -hmm. report. Yeah, coming up on Morning News Now, you've heard of the great resignation, right? A whole bunch of people who quit their jobs over the pandemic. Well, that's a thing of the past for many companies. Now it's all about the great retention. How some of America's largest employers are working to keep their people happy right where they are. Plus, if it's Friday, you know we've got the latest and greatest in can't-miss content for your weekend binging pleasure, including two must-see Disney heavy hitters and an unexpected new novel collaboration from someone who wears a coat of many colors. Or Dolly News? It's up next. <laughs> As record numbers of employees continue to quit their jobs, some employers are having to get creative to retain their workers. As part of our series, The New Normal, NBC News senior consumer investigative correspondent, our friend Vicki Wynn, shows us what some companies are doing to stop that revolving door. The pandemic normalized working from home for millions. And now workers are tilting the scales in their favor. More life, less work. Prompting some companies to find incentives that can convert the great resignation into the great retention. If employers don't do what they need to do to retain employees and keep them happily working there, they're going to constantly have openings to fill. The driving force behind career choices? A recent report found 50% of employees are focused on compensation, 42% on meaningful work. From the data you've gathered, what are the things employers need to do to retain their top talent? Number one is pay them fairly. Number two is think about compensation beyond the salary piece. And third is healthcare benefits. Employers like Ford Motor Company have long offered job sharing. That's when two employees with similar roles go part-time and split one full-time job. But in a company with 183,000 workers, 
it can be hard to find the right partner. What if it was like a dating app? We should be able to go on, a, on an app and look for partners and put a, put a profile in. Aniso and Gwenya and Ami Kapadia designed a new app to help Ford employees find the perfect match. How does it work, Ami? You start out by entering your profile, how you want to grow at the company, what your skill set is, and all of that information gets put into the app and the database. Employees can now find job share partners worldwide. Ford says the app has helped them retain workers and top talent by giving them flexibility to learn new skills or spend more time with family. Not everybody wants to completely walk away from their role or their career. And that was so important to me as well during the pandemic. In Tampa at marketing company PPK, they found something they've been doing since 2019, sustained them through the great resignation, stay interviews the opposite of exit interviews. There's a level of trust that's created by having these meaningful conversations with, with folks on in in a regular ongoing basis. PPK Vice President Garrett Garcia says before the state interviews, PPK retained employees at a rate of 75 to 80 percent. But now they're seeing a retention rate as high as 94 percent. At Boston-based Acceleration Partners, a worldwide marketing firm, employees get money for wellness, for things like a gym membership or a massage. But get this, company founder and chairman Robert Glazer says if an employee takes time off and truly unplugs, they can convert that into cash for their vacation. Wait a minute, so when people go on vacation, you pay them not to check their emails? If they come back and their manager signs off that they have not checked their email, not you know been working, then they can use part of their wellness reimbursement uh, towards their vacation. And now to prevent burnout, the company shuts down for a full week twice a year so no one can work. I think the programs that we have have certainly been a huge part of our retention. We've hired over 100 new employees in the last year. Um, and you know we hear a lot of them that the, that the culture and the programs that we have in place were, were unique and something that, that attracted them to our company. All right, that was NBC's Vicky Wynn and Monster.com's Vicky Salemi hopes all these incentives aren't just a trend. She says this could be the point in time where employers will learn the value of keeping good employees. So hopefully a lot of those new perks remain permanent. The debate over transgender athletes took center stage yesterday after a big win at a major college swim meet. Leah Thomas, a senior at Penn, won in the 500-yard freestyle. Thomas is the first out trans athlete to win a Division I NCAA championship. She fulfilled all the rules for transgender students to compete. Still, she faced opposition at the race outside the arena. A small group of protesters chanted, save women's sports. Now, across the country, many states are following through with bans on transgender student athletes. And one athlete athlete in Iowa is speaking out against that state's new law. NBC News Now anchor Joshua Johnson has that story. I've never really thought of sports as a, for me, like a competitive way. Like many kids in high school, freshman Gavi Smith loves to play sports. For her, it's about camaraderie. It was something that like all the girls did pretty much. And I was just like, oh, I just want to be, I want to be like that and just join the team and just have fun and stuff. Smith has competed in volleyball, softball, track, and was gearing up to take a swing at golf. But Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds signed House File 2416. It bans transgender girls from playing women's sports from kindergarten through college. It just made me sad that people would feel that way and um, want this to happen. I tried to hide it because I was at school and I just needed that strong, like, aspect of me, so. Gavi says she always identified as a girl. In fourth grade, she made it official. I just remember that was like the big step, like changing my name wise, like in school. And I just remember the teacher being like, is this the name that you want on your desk? And I was just like, yes, that's perfect. Tiffany Smith says she remembers when her daughter's identity sank in. I think it was in third grade is when Gabby wore the dress to school without my knowledge and then came home with it on, which at that point I kind of had an aha moment like okay this isn't this isn't going away it's not a phase but now Gabby's life enters a new phase with Iowa's new law affecting her athletics just doing these sports like volleyball it was like the first ever like girl sport that I have ever done it really helped me through my transition with um, the people that I played with and just being part of a team. 
This latest ban comes after almost a dozen similar laws in Republican-controlled states. Governor Reynolds calls it a fairness issue. She claims that trans athletes have an unfair advantage in women's sports. I'd like to reiterate the principle of this bill. Women deserve the same opportunity as men to develop their talents and strive for excellence. The principle of equality, equal opportunity, justifies virtually all the progress women have made over the centuries. I think what we've really seen is a race to the bottom among these state legislators. They are in a competition to see who has the least tolerance for the existence of trans students. Jillian Brandstetter works with the National Women's Law Center. She argues that these new state laws violate federal laws, including the non-discrimination policy known as Title IX. It can be a bit confusing because we know that trans kids under Title IX uh, do have a right to equal access to facilities at schools, a right to safe schools, and certainly a right to fair participation in athletics. Uh, we will continue to see these laws challenged in court. These laws can take a mental toll on trans youth. Last year, a national survey by the Trevor Project found 42% of LGBTQ youth said they seriously considered suicide. That includes more than half of transgender and non-binary youth. They are already not doing well. They already face really high and really grave risks for violence, for mental health distress, for suicide, uh, everything from lower grades and dropping out of school to future chances of homelessness and living in poverty. Gavi Smith says sports helped her cope with the realities of being transgender giving her a place to belong. Gabby being able to play sports has really brought her mental health around in a positive aspect. Her grandma always tells her when she's out playing sports, you have such a pretty smile, keep smiling when you're out there because it looks like you're having so much fun. I just want everyone to know that we're not here to steal your titles, your scholarships, um, your trophies. All we want is just to be included. Our thanks to Joshua Johnson for that report. It's time for our Can't Miss list. All the movies, TV, and music you should check out this weekend because everyone will be talking about it on Monday. Joining us now with more and his top picks is Brian Balthazar. He's an entertainment journalist and pop culture expert. Brian, our human shot of espresso, as I like to call you. Good morning on this Friday. So there are a lot of great movie options this weekend. Two big ones from Disney. Cheaper by the Dozen, a remake and a new animated movie that's going viral already turning red. Tell us about these. Right, okay. First of all, shout out to the yellow plaid. I love it. Cheaper <laughs> by the Dozen is a great film. You know, this is the third time they've made this into a movie. A family of 12 that encounters a lot of uh, challenges along the way. And of course, in this particular story point, there's one involving the family business and a change of location. But it's really adorable. It's a great story. The kids are precocious. That, of course, is on Disney Plus and is a must-see. Then we have Turning Red by Pixar. Pixar knows how to make a movie, let's be honest. And this involves a 13-year-old girl who discovers that she turns into a giant red panda at inopportune moments. It's a story about friendship and family and those awkward years of being 13 years old. Uh, and I just love a, I love me a Pixar movie. What can I say? So this is going to be a fun one also on Disney. All right, let's, let's talk about TV. I want to ask about two new fictionalized series based on real true stories, The Dropouts about Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes, and then The Thing About Pam, actually based off of a Dateline podcast. Should people check those out? I have already. <laughs> Absolutely, me too. I'm obsessed with the Elizabeth Holmes. Me too. Theranos case. I don't know about you, I could not get enough of it. And of course, Amanda Seyfried on Hulu uh, plays her in this uh, docu-series. I shouldn't say docu-series, fictionalized series. And she's really nailing the lowered voice and the eyes and the whole look. And the story is just compelling. You know, it is the season of the, the upper class grifter here where you're taking money from really big investors and banks and companies. We're seeing a lot of stories being told about that. And they're all real life stories. You don't want to miss this. It's really good. And of course, then we have the thing about Pam. I'm a big fan of Renee Zellweger and I'm a big fan of uh, crime stories and of course this inspired by the true story that Dateline followed. I think they did like five or six episodes or more on this story. Renee Zellweger plays the friend of a family that has a uh, murder take place and is she involved in some way? We don't know. I don't like to give too much away but of course Keith Morrison is going to have a little bit of a part of this story. You have to watch this. Uh, on Peacock and then also on NBC. So this is a must-see show. It's so good. All right, Brian, we've got about 30 seconds with you, but I want to hear about an unlikely pair writing a thriller. Joe might be more interested <laughs> in it. Dolly Parton and, and James Patterson, okay. 
Run, <laughs> Rose, run. Of course, the story follows a country music singer who has a, a checkered past. How could this, you know, maybe art imitating life? I don't know, but it's already a bestseller. And it's Dolly Parton. What more do you need to know? Yeah, very I can do that cool. in 10 seconds. Dolly Good Parton, morning. go read it. There you go. That's all I need. All right. Brian, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Brian, Lots to check out. Have a great weekend. That does it for this hour morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.